I can tell you in, in words, but ideally it's something that you experience. It's the most difficult question to ask, you know, if somebody says to you, what, you know, what is Zenny or is a dinner party? I, I mean, I, I usually change the subject. What can happen to a lot of folk and what the practice is about is that because the way we're brought up, uh, because of the images we have about ourselves, about the conditioning we have, about you know the karmic package we bring into life through our folks, through their history, we have a way of experiencing the world. Uh, we have a way perhaps of feeling that, that we're in a particular movie that we're directing <laughs> and it isn't like that. You know, the movie goes wrong. We're not directing it. Things happen. The conditioning and the ways we learn to be in the world that were useful when we were young or when we were teenagers or even in our 20s stop being useful. They, they keep us stuck. They're no longer appropriate. So a lot of the practice is about being releasing ourselves, letting go of those so that we can be more free. It's a creative process, you know. It's almost as though each of us is our own artist and the raw material is our lives. And our, our, our job in a way is to express that life as fully and as completely as we can with all the talents that we've got. Shakyamuni Buddha, the originator, the human being of Buddhism, realized what he called Four Noble Truths. One is that life is many of us. He calls it dukkha, which actually means a stuck axle, but which can be interpreted as suffering. But actually, I actually prefer to say more that a lot of the time, many of us feel a sense of lack in our lives. And what is this lack? You know, why do we feel a sense of lack? He said the sense of lack arises out of desire. It doesn't mean desire necessarily in a sexual sense. Obviously, we need that or none of us would be here talking, you know. But he means the desire for our lives on an ongoing basis to be different than how they are. So, you know, we've got what we've got we don't want, or what we haven't got we do want, or we cling to things, um, or we become trapped in ways of thinking and concepts and ideas, and we don't want to let go of them. Our desire is to, to hold on to them. And all these things trap us and leave us feeling stuck and not free. Arise really out of what we could call a small self or the ego. The third, that's the second noble truth, it arises out of it. The third noble truth is that fortunately there is a relief from suffering and Buddhism is only about that. It's only about the relief of suffering. Yeah, I was born in um, Bagnall Street, which is five streets down from Liverpool Football Club. It was a uh, two up, two down outside toilet with uh, squares of the Liverpool Echo for the toilet paper we had. Yeah, uh, no bathroom. Yeah, we went to the um, w which an area which is now the Anfield Bakery. Uh, there was a, a wash house there, so on Saturday mornings, my mum would take the washing, and I'd go and have a bath. <laughs> yeah, I was the only kid in the street to pass the eleven plus, and I went to. It was difficult for me. I, I was kind of wasn't very much at home in the street, and I wasn't very much at home at the school I went to because it was all kids from South Liverpool that we thought were middle class and out. So I never kind of fitted in, but I was good at chemistry. We didn't have much choice, but I was good at chemistry. And so at eighteen, I got the opportunity to go to university, and I chose chemistry. I went to Loughborough. So it's pretty cool for me, it was in the 60s, Beatles had just had their first number one, I turned up on a motorbike with a black mop haircut. So I was, you know, it was cool, it was, it was okay. Uh, and then I got a place at Manchester University to do a PhD, and that was in chemistry. And I was working on, um, for the Ministry of Defence on plastics for spaceships that uh, stayed flexible at low temperatures and didn't melt at high temperatures. And one of the base chemicals we used were nitrosoamines. And um, toward the end of the three years of the PhD, my father died. He worked at a Dunlop rubber factory. And one of the chemicals they worked with were nitrosoamines. And he died of bladder cancer. So I thought, bugger that, you know, I, that wasn't where I was going to. So once I'd done the oral uh, for the PhD, which I passed, I then left chemistry and university and academic life altogether 
and open the Everyman Bistro with my partner then Paddy, which is in the base of the Everyman Theatre. So this would be what late sixties, early seventies, very early seventies. Yeah, we were really successful from day one. You know, when we opened, there was nothing much in Liverpool like that. Um, to have a menu even without chips was exceptional, and to sell things like pizza and quiche was almost unknown in those days. You know, we were having quite a lot of trouble on the door. We used to have big queues to come in, and Paddy and I managed the door. And I decided I'd take up some martial arts, and I turned out to, to really like it and to be really good at it. So, and I saw a magazine article about this uh, Japanese martial arts teacher in Okinawa. And something really appealed to me about it, and I just wrote. And what I discovered later was that the letter arrived and there was a student from Tokyo at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, the, the dojo, the martial arts training uh, hall, who could read my letter. He spoke English and he read it out to Master Weichu, who told him to write to me and invite me to, to go and train. So I did. It was a real culture shock because at the time, you know, uh, the biggest perhaps was on the first night because I arrived late and I couldn't find anywhere to stay and I booked into a hotel and they showed me into the room and I couldn't understand it. It was full of pornographic magazines and red lights and all kinds of toys and I realised in the morning it was a love hotel that they used to, they used to sublet for an hour during the day. At night nobody wanted it because they were all back with their wives or whatever so, they would, so that was my introduction to a love hotel. But then they found me an apartment and I stayed there for a year. It was an intense physical martial arts training, basically. I trained twice a day, five, six days a week for a year. Uh, I was, you know, I was hot shit by the time I'd finished. I went to Japan with the idea that it would, it would have a spiritual dimension. That was my whole intention. You know, I'd, I'd, maybe the death of my father, I don't know. But I'd been, pretty much from 18, I'd been really successful in everything I did. And I still felt this whole this whole gap, you know, it, it, I still didn't feel satisfied. And when I went to Japan, I thought I'd find something that would fill the gap, you know. And, and although it was a wonderful experience, it, there wasn't a spiritual dimension to it that I, that, that gelled for me. And so when I came back, I started to look uh, at lots of other spiritual disciplines and, and, and explored several. And then saw uh, an advertisement in a Buddhist magazine for a, a retreat that was going to be in London, led by what turned out to be Mizumi Roshi, who, the founder of Zen, uh, his first successor, his second successor, Genpo, at the time, Genpo Sensei. And they phoned him up and said, could I go? And they asked me if I had any meditation experience because it was really intense. And I lied and said I'd had, I hadn't had a bean. So I turned off and that's in 82 and that's when I found the practice that I'd been looking for. As soon as I was, was there and was on the cushion, I felt, you know, this is it. I started a, a facilitator, we called it facilitator because I wasn't a teacher in those days, a meditation group in Liverpool in the 90s. And that developed into something we call the Liverpool Zen Group. And we used to operate out of a flat that I had down on the docks. And then we moved upstairs and then I received transmission. I became a formal teacher. And whilst all this was happening, as a house in the Lake District, we developed it so that it would be a place to do retreats. And whilst I was there, I was thinking of the new name for this Sangha because it now could be an official. And what I realized was the two most common Features of the Lake District are stone and water. And I also realised that they gelled with this idea of hard soft. So that's where the name came from, stone water. Yeah. And then the Sangha developed from there. I had um, people who had been sitting with me really signed up. And a fantastic group of people around me. And the Sangha is now thriving and large with centres around the country. So the Sangha is the community of people that come together to train and they can support each other, you know, in good times and bad times. So it acts as a, a refuge. So that's the other thing about the practice, it acts as a refuge. It's important to have a teacher because it's really difficult to work on yourself by yourself. It's, it's even more difficult to sit, to meditate on your own than with other people. There's a certain group power that comes out of sitting together and, and you know, and supporting one another. We can easily 
uh, and never any point to exclude myself from this, we can easily, uh, the, the ego can really manipulate, it's very clever, can play clever tricks. The great thing that the ego most wants is to be enlightened. <laughs> it thinks if it's enlightened, then it'll have, you know, imagines if it's enlightened, it'll have, it'll have credibility and spiritual power and you know, all those things. Uh, completely missing the point that if it was enlightened, it wouldn't be there. <laughs> it's gone. problems and if I ever get really stressed about something you know, just sitting there for an hour it, it just it's incredible how the answer just comes to problems you know using books or trying to meditate on your own at home I don't think you can you can kind of lose your thread and go down go down keep going down different routes and and not get getting very deep with your practice Whereas a teacher who's got a lot more experience and they've been taught, they can kind of hold your feet to the fire and say, well, you're missing this, or you, you know, you're not seeing that. And act like a mirror, really, which is very hard to do for yourself, I think. So when people first come along, definitely I think it helps. I think they get a shock. They really get a shock when they sit for the first time and they find how busy their minds are. Uh, and then, you know, often people say, oh, well, they, they, they believe that you're supposed to stop thinking when you meditate. And that's not possible. The function of the mind is to think, so it thinks. You can't stop it. As soon as you stop it, it's like standing on a hose pipe, you know, the water will come out somewhere else. So there's quite a lot initially to learn. Uh, and in that initial learning, I think people do benefit. And then it becomes a much, it becomes more, uh, more about real change. And that's when the commitment is needed and the uh, willingness to, 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 to be present to your life in all the things that are happening and not to avoid it, you know, not to turn away. So oddly enough in Zen we say when a shit hits the fan, we turn around and we walk into the fan, we don't walk away. Okay. He looks very happy. That way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, here's, for, for anybody that's viewing this, here's a, a column. It's a Western style column. It's not, so it's not giving anything away. Although I'm not going to give you the answer anyway. So, imagine there's a goose in a bottle, put in a bottle when it was quite young and it grew till it's quite large. The problem is the glass bottle has got a very narrow neck. How do you get the goose out the bottle without either killing the goose, starving the goose, or breaking the glass. And here's a few things, questions to ask. What does the glass bottle represent? And who put the goose in the bottle? <laughs>